Wait, this is the wrong game. Snake, I made an oopsies and destroyed the latest shipment of weapons to Mother Base. What? My fault, G. Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker is the black sheep of the Metal Gear franchise, but I'd be lying if I said it wasn't my favorite. It's the most overlooked due to not being a numbered entry and being on the PSP, which is a huge shame for the game that has the most legendary final boss ever made. But because I don't know how to play games normally, I decided that it would be a fantastic idea to play it again without the usage of guns. Luckily, defining what a gun is is pretty simple. For the sake of the challenge, as long as it's not under any of the gun categories in the R&D menu, it's legal. Peace Walker is also one of the few games to not have difficulty settings, so all we need to do is enter our name and jump right in. Upon starting the game, you're thrown into a not-so-brief tutorial segment about your basic controls in CQC. Afterwards is another actually short tutorial with your starting loadout. The only thing you're required to do here is throw a grenade at a door, and last I checked, grenades are not guns. You're introduced to the 16-year-old who can magically spew love hearts and launch a grown man and receive a lecture on Central American conflict. After hearing the voice of the boss in a recording, Snake agrees to a deal with this guy who may or may not be named after a housing-related invention from 1878. You're then thrown into the first real mission of the game, which then tasks you with reaching a designated area. You still have the same basic loadout, which includes an M16 and a Trank pistol that you can't use. Luckily, Peace Walker gives you a variety of options for dealing with enemies. Although your CQC options are much sparser than in Snake Eater or even MGS4, you still have quite a bit at your disposal. It doesn't really matter though, as using your stun gun or throwing an enemy against a wall so hard that they stick to it is almost always the best option. For the time being, you also have empty gun magazines you can throw to distract enemies, or grenades to just kill them outright although the latter option does make a lot of noise and can alert nearby enemies. Mission 1 here is pretty straightforward though, so you won't need to think too hard about it. Before hopping into the next mission, it's time to edit our loadout a little bit. Or at least it would be if we actually had anything to equip. We don't have very much in the way of equipment, nor do we have the people to make it yet. You're best off staying with the standard jungle fatigues camo as well. It provides good all-around camo which will do you just fine, as the camo system is leagues less important than it was in MGS3 and 4. Mission 2 doesn't vary all that much from Mission 1, at least in the first few areas. It's important to be picking up soldiers whenever you can now that you have your Fulton system though. Enemy soldiers are what's going to get us the important equipment that we need later in the game. This second area here has some interesting enemy placement. No matter what approach I take, I will get spotted. I didn't have any empty magazines, so I ended up using a grenade to get the enemy's attention. This didn't work, so I had to fight them off. The final area has guards that are much more spread out. Most of them are easy to take down apart from the ones in and around the guard tower. I tried the grenade strat again, which actually worked this time, as it forces the guard in the tower to leave and lets you pick off the rest of them. Snake gets introduced to the Sandinistas and- Oh my fucking god, it's the copyright monster! Get it off, get it off, get it off, get it off! Oh, and uh, rocket launchers are not guns. Which is a good thing, because finishing this mission unlocks the first rocket launcher of the game, the law. Luckily, the law is unlocked immediately and does not require a specific R&D level or development time, and it will now be our primary weapon for the foreseeable future. Rarely will you actually need to use lethal force in this game, but in various instances where you are overwhelmed or do need to kill enemies, the law is much quicker and easier to use than grenades. Mission 3 is more the same from the past two missions, but upon exiting the final arena, you cross paths with an armored vehicle. Peace Walker contains a variety of missions where you're tasked with taking out various military vehicles. The main story only contains three of these, and they're one of the only times where using your rocket launcher is mandatory in a no-gun challenge. Luckily, the map this AV fight takes place in has this shack that serves as a reliable camping spot. Unfortunately, our current level 1 law cannot take out the vehicle on its own. If every rocket lands on the gas canisters for extra damage, each one will do about 1.5 bars of health. The law has 6 shots, and the AV has 10 bars of health, which leaves 1 bar left over. This wouldn't matter if we had the support marker, but we're not far enough in the game to have it unlocked yet. This leaves us with our supply of grenades, which luckily can do decent damage. Even with their relatively long explosion timer, the AV likes to stop in place and shoot you, which makes them super easy to hit. This leads us to- Oh, get the hell away from me! Anyways, Snake kills a child and we unlock support markers. We also have smoke grenades now, which are absolutely busted in Peace Walker. Peace Walker's generally small area size, combined with the sheer number of them you get, allows them to cover so much area. 
The smoke grenades themselves make you completely undetectable from either sight or sound and will stun any enemies in their area of effect for their entire duration, which is pretty damn long, especially with upgrades. If you don't feel like going through an enemy encounter, smoke grenades will allow you to skip it. It honestly ends up trivializing a lot of the game, including this next mission where I got spotted, dropped a smoke, got in a box, and moved on with my day. After exploding my way through this train area and confirming the bad guys do indeed have nukes, Snake gets ambushed by a whole ass tank, and somehow lives a near direct shot to the train car he was in. The tank is quite a bit more, well, tanky than the armored vehicle. Ammo is no longer a huge issue thanks to the supply marker, but it will take a bit more of a specialized strategy this time around. What I did was to let the tank shoot this yellow train and then camp behind it. The tank won't go back there which lets me pop in and out to shoot it. This still leaves the enemy soldiers to deal with though. I killed all of them except one and knocked the last one out in a spot where it would be unlikely for him to die to the tank. From here, it's just about getting in rockets whenever you can and resupplying when you run out. Beating the tank in C4. It's not really all that useful, but it is mandatory for this next mission which requires you to blow up a wall. This wall leads you to a new area, which is easy enough to sneak or explode your way through. The exception to that is this last area with the fortress. It can be pretty tricky, especially if you've already used up a lot of your smokes. There's only one way to get in, which is via the ladder right at the front, in the line of sight of like five different guards, some of which are almost impossible to deal with without causing an alert. I attempted to smoke my way through, but I got spotted. I managed to wait it out in a box before immediately getting spotted again. I ended up having to fight my way through about a dozen enemies, which wasn't too much of an issue. This game isn't that hard, especially in these early missions. This guy named Fire Iceman or something walks in and kills a disabled guy and threatens to launch a nuke with this robo-dinosaur thing. Before we could stop him, this giant unmanned mech named the Pupa flies in and tries to be God's drunkest driver. This is the first real boss of the game. Running around and shooting the AI pod with rockets is going to get you through about 90% of the fight. As long as you can dodge its attacks, you really have nothing to worry about. Your biggest concern is likely going to be these shock units. The people will periodically scatter these around the arena in order to give its electricity attack more range. You can shoot these to get rid of them, but it's very likely that you'll still get clipped by one. And even then, using grenades is too slow and using rockets is too wasteful. After a couple attempts, I ditched the running around strat and switched to camping up on this ledge, which somehow made it even easier. This basically invalidates half of the pupa's attacks. Just be sure to lay down whenever it charges up the sidewalls. It likes to stay still and eat rockets, so just fire away from the ledge for a few minutes and it's done. You're now tasked with making it to ah! You're now tasked with making it to the lab of Dr. Strangelove, the scientist in charge of the AI pods. The areas in this mission are very wide open and are filled with enemies that will stay in one spot and try to ambush you. It's very easy to sneak behind and just hit them with a sunrod though. Their vision isn't very good. Eventually, you run into an attack helicopter and are forced to fight it. This is the last of the military vehicle mini-bosses in the main story, and it is far and away the worst one. It can be incredibly hard to hit its weak points, and the cover you have isn't nearly as good as the cover in the tank or AV fights. The best spot to camp is behind this rock with the tree, but it's still easy to get hit when you try and shoot the helicopter. Because of its relatively small fuel tanks, there's a good chance you'll mostly be hitting body shots. This drags out the mission a ton because it takes, on average, three rockets to take away one bar of health. The soldiers aren't too much of a problem in this fight, as it's really easy to just smoke them out, take care of them with CQC, and fold in them away. My winning attempt ended up taking like eight and a half minutes, but it's not too bad if you're patient. The next mission is back to making it to the lab. It introduces enemies with ghillie suits, who can be somewhat difficult to spot from a distance, but if you're anywhere remotely close, they stick out like a sore thumb. You'll also see in these clips that I have the shield equipped. I had just gotten it, so I wanted to try it out, but it was pretty useless and barely helped. Speaking of useless and barely helping, you find Cecile, and she tells you about the laboratory and the AI pod where the voice of the boss was coming from. After one more area of ruins, you find the lab, use Huey's keycard, and it doesn't work. The next mission is a stupid backtracking quest where you have to go all the way back to the beginning, find this guy in orange, steal his keycard, and then go all the way back to the lab again. You finally meet Dr. Strangelove and she fucking hates you, but she lets Snake see the mammal pod, the AI pod that is an attempt to emulate the consciousness of the boss. Snake goes inside the pod and has an absolutely wild trip, probably from that shit Strangelove gave him. It gives him more flashbacks of the boss where Snake does actually shoot by your own action. 
There's a huge difference between dreaming about firing a gun and actually firing a gun though, so I'll let this one slide. Snake wakes up from his trip in the courtyard and- OH MY FUCKING GOD KILL IT KILL IT <clears throat> So, the chrysalis is this big flying robot that's been bugging you for the whole game up to this point. This thing flies around constantly which makes it super difficult to hit. Even when it decides to stay still, it still has instant transmission powers, so half the time your shots are going to completely miss. Most of what you will be hitting are body shots, which aren't too much of a problem as the chrysalis isn't the most tanky thing in the world. Do beware of whenever you need to resupply though. Staying in one spot is dangerous because of its railgun attack, which just kills you. And you need to be behind cover or else you'll get lit up by its machine gun. The chrysalis can also send out drones which are a ginormous pain in the ass and a huge waste of ammo, especially considering how hard to hit they can be because of how slow your rockets are. Once you do get openings, it's really not too hard though. And with the defeat of this thing, I'll never have to worry about copyrighting music in my video ever again. Defeating the chrysalis unlocks the FIM and Carl Gustav rocket launchers which are important to develop as soon as possible. The FIM is a lock-on rocket launcher and the Carl Gustav has a much faster projectile speed. Both of these also do far more damage than the law, which makes them good for boss fights. Snake needs to go to the facility where the mammal pod was taken in order to stop the completion of Peace Walker. That's the name of the game! Spicy Mintman's mech designed for nuclear deterrence, or at least his very radical version of it. The next mission is literally one area, which leads to the mine that the facility is inside of. Unfortunately, Snake gets spotted and is ambushed by soldiers defending the base. These enemies start out very far away from you, which allows the Fem to really shine. You just wait for it to lock on, shoot, and forget about it. This was a bit slow though, which allowed for some enemies to get close. If they did, I just switched to my law and took care of them. After killing all the enemies, Snake tries to enter the base, but surprise surprise, it's already time for another boss fight. This behemoth of a machine is the Cocoon, and it has like 8 different weapons which are all trying to kill you. The main gun is easy enough to avoid. It will try and shoot you a few times, but you can easily run away. Be careful though, as the last shot will purposefully aim ahead of you to try and catch you. So either stop, or start running the opposite way. The two miniguns mounted on its treads are easy to run away from. But you're almost guaranteed to take some chip damage from the machine guns scattered along its sides. Getting rid of them would waste too much time and ammo, so it's best to ignore them. When the cocoon gets down to 4 bars of health, it will malfunction and start ramming into the sides of the quarry. This makes the ladders on its sides drop, which allows you to climb on it. It will try to prevent you from getting up, but I was lucky enough to get a good stretch of time where it didn't attack me. This let me get it down to 2 health bars before I ended up running out of ammo. I climbed to the top where the AI pod was and threw every grenade I had at it, but it still didn't die. I was forced to jump down and resupply because you can't place support markers on the cocoon itself for some reason. But it wasn't too hard to climb back up and deliver the killing blow. And deliver the killing blow. Next up, you need to smoke, I, I mean sneak, your way through the hangar that contains Peace Walker. It's far more difficult than previous sneaking missions, but if you put on your big boy pants, you'll be just fine. Unlucky for you, Snake doesn't understand that shooting somebody will kill them, so he begins to argue with a robot. He's very loud, so he gets caught and thrown in jail. Strangelove decides to put you in the torture chamber. I say you to mean both yourself and Snake, because these are some of the most brutal QTE segments in any video game ever. You have to mash. First for 10 seconds, then 15, then 20, and it has to be at full speed or you die. If you manage to make it out, you're thrown in a cell and have to break out. All this requires you to do is look in the mirror to grab your jigsaw, and then file down the lock on the cell door. You're gonna have to rely on pure stealth and CQC to break out, but that shouldn't be too much of a problem. There are only a few guards, so it's easy to go up to them individually and slam them into a wall. After running out of the base, Peace Walker emerges from the ground and begins its trek toward- uh, um, Peace Walker uses the same arena as Cocoon. This doesn't mean much though, as you'll want to stay at the bottom at all times. One of the tricky parts of the Peace Walker fight is that it will constantly turn and face away from you, which prevents you from hitting its weak point. The only way to reliably get to its front side is to run between its legs, but doing so is incredibly dangerous. It will either use its flamethrower or try to stomp you. The flamethrower has a giant hitbox, but Peace Walker will announce the attack, which should give you enough time to avoid it. The stomps are much harder to avoid. They aren't audibly telegraphed, and it can be hard to see where Peace Walker's foot is due to the wonky camera. The attack itself is very fast, and even if it doesn't directly hit you, 
you can still be stunned from the shockwave which will take out a huge chunk of your psyche meter. This is basically a stamina bar, and if it runs out, you're stunned for 15 seconds or more as you try to get up. It will take away your stamina if you're hit as well, and it'll of course doom almost all of your health. It's possible to catch Peace Walker's foot as it stomps on you. You could do the same thing with the cocoon, which the Versus Battles wiki calculated to be about 323,000 metric tons of force. Don't question the logistics too much. It's very hard to line up anyway, and you don't even get much of a reward for it. Once Peace Walker gets to low health, it'll throw a hissy fit and begin stomping around the arena while pissing fire all over the place. It's incredibly difficult to not get hit by this, but I somehow managed to avoid it on my winning attempt. Once you beat Peace Walker, it flops over and dies. When heavens divide, I will see the choices within my- It then gets back up and begins to follow a helicopter piloted by Strangelove and Sweaty Shiverman. You chase after it in an interactive cutscene before Snake tries to climb a nearly vertical wall with a horse, and the mission ends. Snake goes up to the dying horse and it, 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 he, he, he shoots it. Uh, he's still having flashbacks, so I'll blame it on Strangelove. First things first, you need to infiltrate a military base where Paz is being held hostage. I completely messed up this rocket launcher shot, which alerted the guards, but after a couple smokes, I got out of there without issue. This rings true for the second area, which is very wide open and contains a lot of enemies. The final area only contains a few soldiers and kidnappers, which can be taken care of easily. The solution I found for this last area was to chuck a smoke all the way to the other side to stun the soldiers, then rocket the kidnapper, before booking it all the way over to the other side. I then waited for this guy to come over so I could do a ladder takedown. This alerts the other guy, which causes him to run over and suffer the same consequence. Snake enters the communications tower and sees Paws in the camera system. The whole base gets alerted to his presence, and he needs to go to the control tower to finally stop Peace Walker. This is the only mission in the game where you are explicitly meant to be running and gunning, and it is the hardest one by far. After about an hour of trial and error, I finally developed a strategy to make it through this gauntlet of enemies. The first area has you backtracking from the communications tower. I peeked out of this doorway to get rid of a kidnapper with my film, before doing the same to a guard across the pit. I locked on and took out this sniper and a second kidnapper, before equipping grenades and my shield. I would aim in and look up while I was walking across the pit in order to block any bullets, and hit the remaining guard with a ladder takedown. I would then use the cover I had to try and take out the next two enemies with my grenades. One of them ended up living, so I just took care of him with my stun rod. In the next area, I sat up on this balcony and picked off any soldiers that I could with my rocket launchers before switching to my grenades. After everyone was taken care of, I called in a resupply to refill my launchers and rations. The next area is nearly impossible with just launchers, so this is where I begin to spam smoke grenades and run as fast as I can down the middle. This would usually leave me with only two or three left, so I had to be very sparing with how I used them from here on. The next area has a ton of enemies right behind you that will immediately try to kill you. I got into one of the corners and picked them off with the Carl Gustav. After that, you need to run to the end of the tunnel. Some more enemies will spawn behind you, but you can ignore them and use the elevator. If you made it through all of that, you now possibly, maybe, kinda have a good attempt. This last area at the heliport is brutal. You are in an exposed area with enemies shooting you from all sides, plus a helicopter from above, and you need to get rid of all of them. Whatever you do, do not leave the area right outside of the elevator. Going anywhere else is far too dangerous. Take care of as many enemies as you can with your launchers. Once you run out of ammo, go outside and place your support marker. There's a good chance you'll get hit with a missile from the helicopter, so it's important to make sure you have your rations equipped. Go back to sniping enemies with rockets, and make sure to mute your video because this song is copyrighted. Once all the soldiers are gone, switch your focus to the helicopter. At this point, you can actually step outside the building without immediately dying. It shouldn't take too long for the helicopters to go down, at which point you can quickly resupply again and take out one last wave of enemies. Snake gets ambushed again after meeting Heatstroke, Frostbiteman, in the control tower, but Doorknob Guy from the beginning comes in and turns all the soldiers on him. He gets shot and Doorknob Guy tries to kill Snake. All of the Sandinistas come in and the day is saved. Peace Walker is still out there though, and it's Snake's job to take care of it. Things quickly go from bad to worse though. Microwave Freezerman isn't dead, and he manages to send false nuclear strike data to Peace Walker, guaranteeing a retaliatory strike from the US if no action is taken. Stovetop Ice Pac-Man is the only one who knows the abort codes, but he dies, so the only way to prevent all-out nuclear war is to destroy Peace Walker once and for all. Oh no! 
It is the bomb launcher. Take action regarding that individual. Relax, I'll handle it. I am the angry bomb. Peace Walker starts out in launch mode. You have to do enough damage to it within a time limit or else you lose. The time limit is very generous and the missiles it sends are very easy to dodge, so it's not a huge issue. Once you interrupt its launch, it will jump into the main area and start attacking you. Peace Walker uses many of the same attacks it had in its first fight, plus some new ones. In the first part though, it'll mostly just send these new drill missiles that can be pretty hard to avoid. Peace Walker will jump away and start walking around the main area. If it can see you in any of the gaps between these buildings, it'll turn to face you and try to attack you. This is actually good because it stays relatively still, which allows you to hit the AI pod. It will then jump into the water, which is basically the same idea. It'll do another launch sequence and then try to shoot you, which leaves it open for some rockets. You do want to be careful for when Peace Walker jumps back into the arena though. It can and will take out a bunch of your stamina. With how much it does it, and how hard it is to avoid, you're almost guaranteed to get knocked out at least once. After one or two cycles, Peace Walker will activate its EM pulse, which will prevent any rockets from hitting it. This is normally not a huge issue, as you would just take out your gun and shoot it. Grenades do fuck all, and good job hitting a support strike. While waiting out the EM pulse, there's a good chance Peace Walker will pull out its charge attack. This attack is nearly impossible to dodge. You will get hit 90% of the time, and the 1 in 10 times you do avoid it are pure RNG. Whenever the red glowing circle around Peace Walker's head orb goes away, you're free to start attacking it again. Don't get too comfy though, as it will come back again later. If you're unlucky like me, it might even happen not even 20 seconds after the first one ended. You're able to catch Peace Walker's stomps like in the last fight, though it's just as inconsistent. It'll be stunned for a reasonable time however, so you are able to hit it once or twice. All you need to do is repeat the cycle for the rest of the fight. Stop the launch sequence, dodge its attacks, shoot it when it jumps away and tries to hit you, get hit by the charge attack, rinse and repeat. Peace Walker is down, but it's still sending the false data. And even after Snake deactivates the mammal pod, it seems that the secondary AI, the reptile pod, is continuing to send the data. After laying some explosives in the Peace Walker one last time, it gets back up. The will of the boss seems to come to life in the AI, and Peace Walker submerges itself ending the transmission. That's the end, goodbye. So, um, I initially wrote that joke because beating Peace Walker marks the first ending of the game, but I remembered what's next, and I almost wish I actually ended the video there. Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker, released for the PlayStation Portable in 2010 before receiving an enhanced port to the Xbox 360 and PS3 the following year, is the best game I've ever played that has a 0 out of 10, completely unforgivable segment to it that will make you want to rip your hair out. If you've played it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's... Just to put this in perspective, all of the footage I had of this playthrough added up to about 18 and a half hours. Five and a half of which consisted of just chapter five. Most of what I'm about to say comes from a GameFAQs thread from 13 years ago because the game seems to love keeping you in the dark about most of this. So, after getting the first ending, Doorknob is taken prisoner in Mother Base, but shortly after, Kaz tells you he's escaped and you need to go find him. This is its own mission, which is easy enough to complete. Once you make it back to the menu, nothing. Turns out what you need to go and do is complete three missions for you to unlock the next one. The game doesn't tell you this, but I guess players would naturally just go and do other missions anyway. You're probably going to want to make those in-between missions the boss fights, because you need to collect parts for Zeke. Zeke is MSF's very own Metal Gear, and depending on if you just beelined the story or not, you may or may not have gotten the parts required for later. You need to have all of the main parts and the railgun. So how do you get these parts? Well you need to fight the AI weapons, but not just in any old way you want. No, you need to specifically avoid hitting whatever part you need. Oh, and you need to do it more than once. And it's somewhat RNG what parts you get. And you only get certain parts from certain bosses. The game does not tell you this. After beating a few bosses, Kaz calls you and lets you know that Doorknob has escaped again. Find him, knock him out, fault at him, and be on your merry way. This time you need to do five missions, which either means blowing up more bosses if you need Zeke parts, or mindlessly doing and redoing the same side mission over and over again. When you hit the required amount, Doorknob escapes a third time. Find him, do more missions, he escapes a fourth time. Find him, do more missions, 
he escapes a fifth time. Find him, do more missions, he escapes a sixth time. Find him, do more missions, nothing. So at this point, you've probably scrambled for the same game facts page I'm using, because this game gives you zero indication of what to do. So you look for the next step after the six doorknob missions, and uh, oh my god. First things first. You need to have developed a second plan for Mother Base, which requires your intel team to be at level 40. If you don't have that, you either need to rearrange your staff or go out and Fulton some soldiers. Once construction does start, you need to complete 13 missions for the plant to be finished. The game does not tell you this. You need to have all of your Zeke stuff done by this point, so finish that if you haven't. And once you do, you need to do three more missions before Kaz calls you and tells you that Zdornov has escaped again. Except this time, he doesn't know where. He's in the target practice room, a place you probably not even thought about for the whole game. Or at least that would happen if this GameFAQs guy wasn't a fucking liar and forgot an entirely different step that you need. If instead you go to the IGN page for the final mission, it will say that your mission support rank also needs to be at least level 2. The game does not tell you this. This is in some back corner menu that you've likely never gone to, and there's no indication as to what you need to do to increase it. Turns out, you need to call in resupplies and supporting fire. So have fun playing the same tank mission over and over again until you finally hit rank 2. Do one more mission, Kaz calls you, you finally head over and find Doorknob in the shooting range, which, as a reminder, is not told to you. And you can finally unlock the true final boss of Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker. On the virtual boy. Pause reveals your true colors and takes control of Zeke in one last ditch effort to get my video demonetized by the power of J-Pop. The Zeke fight is truly a highlight of the game, and I'd go as far as to say that it was worth the Chapter 5 gauntlet to get here. The fight has two main sections. Zeke attacking you from the plant that you're on, and Zeke jumping away to attack from afar. The plant that you're on also has two monitors that allow you to call for resupplies and supporting fire. One's better than those that you can get from your markers. I can never figure out how to use the support fire, so I ended up going without it. Zeke starts out on the main plant. For now, it's not going to do very much to hurt you. It may try to shoot you or stomp you, but that's about it. Trying to catch Zeke stomps isn't worth it, by the way. You'll maybe get one rocket off, but you'd be able to even if you didn't catch it, and that also comes without the risk of getting hit. Once it jumps to the other plant, it'll start to make use of its railgun. This railgun will kill you. The game expects you to use these flaps that pop up out of the ground as cover, but I recommend using the resupply monitor. It blocks the railgun just as well, while giving you fully protected lines of sight to shoot Zeke, as well as the ability to resupply as soon as you need it. Be sure to keep in mind what voice line Paz says. If she says, soon you will witness true hell, or you've got no one to blame but yourself, that means she's going to use the railgun. If she says Vinceremos, she's going to launch missiles at you. The missiles are really easy to dodge just by walking away from them. Eventually, Zeke will jump back to the main plant. Here's where it may start doing some more potent attacks, such as taking crack and running all over the place, or doing the same bullshit slide that Peace Walker had. If you can keep up this cycle for long enough, Zeke goes down without a hitch, and you've officially beaten Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker for the second time. But have you really beaten Peace Walker if you haven't done the secret bosses? I, I mean, well, yeah. In heaven's so if you didn't know, Peace Walker contains three secret bosses as part of a crossover with Capcom's Monster Hunter series. If you go to Extra Op 29, blow up the container, and purposefully backtrack to the beach area, you'll see this little cat guy named Trinya. After you talk to him, you'll see that you've unlocked a mission to go and hunt down Rathalos. Rathalos is pretty easy, and he works pretty much the same as the story bosses. On the ground, he has a couple basic attacks like the charge and the fireball. Rathalos will also begin flying periodically. You can shoot him in the short period that he's stationary to stun him, but it's likely that he'll just get up and do it right again after. Rathalos is very hard to hit with launchers while flying. I had my law equipped instead of the fim, which removed the option for locking on too. Rathalos and the other secret bosses all have infinitely respawning adds, which can be really annoying. They can't shoot you like the soldiers, but they will get in the way, and you can't knock them out to prevent their respawn. Once Rathalos starts dive bombing right at you, he's on his way back down. Just keep dumping rockets into him and he won't give you much trouble. After beating Rathalos and then beating Rathalos again, you fight the Tigrex. As its name would suggest, it's a mix between a tiger and a T-Rex, and it has wings for some reason. 
I, I don't know. I'm not into Monster Hunter lore. Questionable nomenclature aside, I can't fucking stand this thing. Tigrex is way more aggressive than Rathalos and gives you very little in the way of openings. What you're gonna be dealing with about 75% of the time is this dumbass charge attack which it'll do multiple times in a row. It isn't the worst thing in the world at first, but once Tigrex goes into its crack attic mode it begins to bolt at you at Mach 3 which has an incredibly high chance of putting you in a spot where you are guaranteed to take damage because of how much lag there is on your dodge roll. Even if you manage to dodge out of the way of its last charge, it'll almost always do a spin attack that covers its entire body. You're not even safe far away as it has a pounce attack that clears almost the entire arena and has an absurdly large hitbox that is nearly impossible to avoid. I made the huge mistake of going in with the Carl Gustav. It's very powerful, but its downside is its extremely long reload animation. This hasn't really been a factor until now, but because of how little time you have between Tigrex's attacks, you never have an opportunity to actually reload after taking your first shot. This forced me to switch it out for the film, but that didn't exactly make the fight easy. Getting a good attempt relied on favorable RNG so that I didn't get cornered and die. After two hours of attempts, I was finally able to put it down, before being told to do the exact same thing again, but at sunset. The last secret boss is Gear Rex, which you can probably guess is just Metal Gear Rex sans the metal. And for the last boss, it's laughably easy, at least in this first fight. If you stay away from it, there's essentially nothing you can do. It can charge like Tigrex, but it's way slower, and it can only do one at a time. It also has a laser attack that's pretty slow and easy to avoid, plus a crystal launch move that works like the pupa's electromine attack around the arena, which are similarly a non-issue as long as you stay away from them. I switched back to the Gustav here for the damage, and Gear Rex was done. After doing the same thing again at dusk, you have a second Gear Rex fight in Pupa's arena. It has more health and does more damage, but the bigger arena size makes it even easier to run away and spam rockets. The last Gear Rex fight, however, is a nearly 10 minute long test of how long you can run in circles and shoot without making a single mistake, or else you die. Its charge attack has been beefed up to be more like Tigrex and- oh wait, I just killed it. Um, pretend this video has some cool send-off.